to the Fruity Knitting Podcast. This is episode 43. I'm Andrea. And I'm Andrew. This is a show about the wonderful craft of knitting, where we love to inspire you with talented guests from around the world. And this episode, we're featuring an interview with Sue Blacker, who is the owner of the British specialist spinning mill, The Natural Fibre Company. This little mill spins wool for many of the small yarn producers in the UK and Europe that we love to support. It also produces all the yarns for Sue's company, Blackie Yarns, which is really well known for its breed specific yarns. So in the interview, Sue is gonna help us understand our yarn better, which is a great thing, because it means we're gonna be able to make better choices when matching our yarn to our projects. We're also gonna to go to Alabama to meet Jamie, our guest on Knitters of the World. Yep. New releases will be featuring again. We have another tutorial from Andrea on finishing your steaks. We're announcing the winners of the Fruity Brioche Cal and we have something else very special. We visited Exmouth in Western Australia in episode 32. Exmouth is a remote resort town right by a very, one of the most beautiful pristine coral reefs in the world. And we're going back there today to see a beautiful yarn art project, which is a coral reef created out of freeform knitting, crochet, weaving and other crafts. Yeah, it is so special and you're really gonna love it. But let's start with you, Andrew, with Under Construction. Yep. This is my Paris's scarf by Nancy Marchant. It's coming along gradually. I am very proud to say that I am now reading my knitting. Last episode, Andrea created my very own tutorial on how to successfully combine double knitting with brioche, which is what's involved here in the one row. So I've been watching that and it has actually worked. I can work on this project um, without looking at the chart. Good on you. Except when it goes around the corner. Yeah. Which is really cool. Um, I'm even able to do this after a day at work, sitting on the couch watching telly, which we have been doing. Yeah. We've just finished watching Dr. Foster on Netflix. Which isn't very uplifting. No, it was kind of good and, and full of suspense, but it wasn't really a happy program. Um, we've moved on to watching North and South based on the Elizabeth Gaskell novel, which is much more beautiful. Yeah. And um, the whole time we're watching this telly, my knitting is telling me what to do next. That's brilliant. Which is really cool. So if you're wanting to do double knitting and brioche in one row, check out the tutorial. <laughs> Last episode or on Patreon. We're now up to bring and brag with me and I'm so happy I'm really going to bring and brag today. Yay, dolls. Because I've finished my jacket and it's really good I really love it do you like it though <laughs> I, I do yeah. I love it very much I love it more than I thought I was going to love it and that's fantastic um, so let me tell you a little bit more about it it here's a picture of the original it is the Asmors Kofta by Sisel Huyevik and um, Sisel releases her patterns in a kit it comes with the yarn the pattern the buttons the ribbon and you can get it in a blue and pink colorway if you prefer. In fact, all of her designs she releases in kits from her website that you can buy from her website. And sometimes she even helps you uh, choose a different colorway if you, if you prefer, which I think is a brilliant service. That's really cool, yeah. It is really good. So I learned so much from, from knitting this design, both from following Sissel's pattern and from changing the pattern to, to fit my style more so and and Sissel is a really thoughtful designer a really good designer puts a lot of care and love into to what she does and there was quite a few things in her pattern that I'd never done before which is brilliant I love to do different things and learn because it means next time you hack another pattern you can add some things <laughs> it's it's a really great way it, it just find good designers knit their things and and you just learn so much yeah. through doing that so let me just tell you a little bit about the things that I had never done before. First of all was the lining. So she starts off, starts you off knitting a stocking sit, stitch section here, uh, both on the sleeves and the hem, which you later on turn up. That's this dark green section. And that's just a really nice finish. And it gives an extra firmer border on jacket. And there it is there on, on the hem. Yep. So, and then, so you just start in the stocking stitch and then you get straight into the ferrule. So it's a very easy transition and you turn it up. What I did do is use a, a much smaller needle on the stocking stitch section because stocking stitch is always looser than ferrule and it's going to be turned up. You don't want any gathers there. So that's what I did for that. 
The other thing which I found very interesting and I'd never done before is the button bands. And so I picked up my stitches and then you knit in stocking stitch again. So you knit a small section, that's this dark green section, and then you turn it over, there it is there, and you join it back on the inside. So it's like a double layer of stocking stitch. And then from the edge of that, you pick up and you crochet the rest of the band and you crochet in double crochet. So I'd never done that before, but it, it does uh, make a very firm, uh, just a nice firm, solid button band. Yeah. And I'd never done buttonholes in crochet before. So I love doing that. And the other thing I'd never done was reverse single uh, crochet. crochet, which is the edging on this. And what you do is you crochet backwards. So instead of right to left, you, cro you crochet left to right. And it, it makes this very firm kind of pico edging border, which I, again, is just a loving detail, yep. you know, to put on a it's jacket. It's very neat. It is, isn't it's it? It's really come out, you know. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's very professional. Yeah. Good as a bought one is what my old friend would have said. <laughs> Anyway, so it was great to learn those details. I love that. The other thing I love about her design is that the, the main body is just a very simple all over ferrile design. You know, it's very harmonic. And then you've got these very broad, colorful bands of ferrile on the hem and on the, um, on the cuffs. So that was great. Um, I added a ribbon on the inside, a velvet ribbon to cover up my, my steak here. So I think that also, that also looks really good. I love my cropped version. I think it's really cool. It looks great over a, a big shirt, yep. just like this. And I particularly love my collar. <laughs> I added my collar. I am so proud of my collar. I'm gonna turn around and show you what it looks like. It's good, do you wanna do this? Yeah. Hair out the way. So the collar, I picked up the stitches around the neck and then I knitted the collar flat in garter stitch. So it's got the same ferrule pattern as the main body here, but it's in garter stitch. So I, I chose garter stitch because I think it makes it a little bit firmer, firmer fabric, thicker fabric, which suits a collar very well. And it just gives it a different texture, which is also good for a little collar. So the only thing to think about here when you're doing, when you're stranding, normally if you strand flat, it means that you're knitting on one side and then on the back side, you're also stranding, but you're gonna strand in pearl and that's where you, cover, you, you carry your floats. Well, on this, you're gonna be knitting on both sides, but again, you have to make sure your floats are carried on the wrong side of the fabric. And if you can imagine that you're, you've got the wrong side facing you, you have to have your yarn to the front of the work to carry the float, but then you have to have your yarn at the back of the work to knit a knit stitch. So it means you're doing a lot of yarn forward, yarn back, and you can't forget that or you'll end up with a float on the wrong side. But it's only a small section. So it's very easy. And I've just got, I've just made sure that my outside stitches were, are in the, the dark green. So it's got like a little border around it. But I got, I got all my calculations right. And you might notice that it's exactly the same pattern in the right position. Can you see that? Gosh, oh, yeah, I suppose. I, I, I mean, I just took it as a bit of a, a speckledy effect. Well, it, it is more speculative because it's in I'm sorry, it's I'm, not, I'm not appreciating it to the full <laughs> but extent. But that's, that's just a little secret between yep. me and my collar. Okay. That it's actually, <laughs> it actually works. So that was brilliant. Um, okay, the other thing, in the, in the kit you get this lovely silk ribbon that's got flowers on it, and that's to sew down the front. And I think that looks really lovely on the long version. Uh, mm. But I think on my cropped version it makes it a little bit too busy, probably because you've got less of the green. So I think it's more elegant without. You also get these beautiful mother of pearl buttons in three different colors. So I've got soft green, soft pink, and soft blue, which I think is really pretty. They're gorgeous buttons. They come in the kit as well. And anything else? I think, I think that's a good summary. Yeah, did you talk about the yarn? The yarn, yes. 
So I soaked the garment and I blocked it and I was very happy with what the yarn did. It really, it became softer and it, it bloomed out. So that was great. It's Usk and it's, that's the name of the yarn and it comes from a, a fourth generation small family run mill in Norway called Hillesvag. So yeah, and, and they provide the yarn for all of Sissel's uh, design so I'm very happy with it I think I think it's great I'm thrilled so throughout knitting this jumper I've been doing a series of short tutorials basically on how I've been doing the steaks and that supports our fruity steaked cowl which is running to the end of January so you haven't joined join in it's going to be a lot of fun there's a lot of chatter there there's a lot of really experienced steakers so you can ask questions but this is your chance to give steaking a go I have done one more short tutorial for you and that's how I finished trimming my steaks and sewing them back. So that's coming up for you now. I hope you find it helpful and you enjoy it. And straight after that, you're gonna meet the gorgeous Jamie from Alabama. This garment is nearly finished. I only have to trim back and finish some steaks and pick up the stitches to finish this right front button band. You can see that I've already worked the left front button band. I've just placed my buttons here. They haven't been sewn on, but it's just to show you what it's gonna look like. So in this tutorial, I'm gonna show you how I trim back the steaks and sew them flat to the garment, as well as showing you the steps that I take to complete the front button bands and other finishing. So the jacket has steaks going down the centre front, it has a steak in the armholes of the body and a steak in the front neck opening. I've turned the garment inside out to show you the steaks that I've already trimmed and sewn. So this is what it looks like completed on the armhole, so that's the armhole steak there. And here is the front neck steak that's been trimmed and sewn flat on the garment. And it goes from here to there. And you can see that it really does lie flat and neat when it's finished. This steak has been left unfinished so I can show you the steps that I take. So before that I've sewn in the sleeve to the armhole and now I'm going to trim it back to just a half stitch away from my zigzag sewing line. So the steak was reinforced with a zigzag stitch on the sewing machine and that goes to about here so I'm just going to cut it around there. Make sure you always have your hand behind where you're going to cut so that you don't accidentally cut into two layers of fabric. So I've trimmed back my steak and because the steak has been reinforced with the sewing machine I could actually just leave it without sewing. It's not going to unravel but I do want to reduce the bulk and sewing it flat is going to help to do that. To sew back the steak you take a piece of yarn and I split it in two so that I'm using a thinner piece and not adding more bulk to the seam. You might think that this will make the sewing thread weaker and it does but if it's the right woolen spun sticky yarn it's going to felt slightly with time and wear which prevents anything from coming undone anyway. So using a darning needle I just thread my yarn through the seam and up here and just loosely catch the outside edge. So if the steak hadn't been reinforced here I would just make sure that I'm weaving into each one of these V's over the top and in and out and back again and that way it would it would uh, slightly felt and nothing would come undone. I'm not going right through to the front side, I'm just going underneath one of the, the, the floats from the, see there, just under, gently underneath that and then back up here through the centre of, of that stitch. So you can see in this section here that I've sewn down, it's already lying flatter and with wear over time, that's just going to felt and, and get smoother and flatter. I'm now going to pick up stitches to knit my front button band. This steak has only just been cut up the center. It hasn't been trimmed or sewn back. I'll do that right at the end after I've knitted the band. You can see that the left side button band has been completed. And if you have a look at it, I first of all knitted in stocking stitch. That's the dark green section. And then the outside section in the lighter green is crocheted. Because my front band 
here, button band, is knitted in stocking stitch and not rib, I'll need fewer stitches than if I was going to knit a ribbed band, because rib always pulls together and has negative ease. So that means that I'll pick up stitches in roughly two out of every three rows. This column of light blue stitches here marks the edge of my steek and I'm going to be picking up my stitches on the column on the other side of that, the column of stitches on the other side of that. So quite often you're told that you just pick up putting your needle through one leg of the stitch but if you see that if I pull on that that's going to create a bit of a hole. So I like to put my needle through both legs of that stitch and you can see if I pull on it there's no hole. I go under both legs of the stitch and again and then I'm going to miss this next stitch and go into the next one and that means that I'm going knitting into two out of every three rows. I've picked up all of the stitches along this right side front button band and you can see that I'm now ready to work the button band and what naturally happens when you've picked up all your stitches is that the steek lies flat on the inside of the garment, it just wants to do that. So this steek just has to be trimmed back just like this one here, so that button band I've already worked. You can see it's been trimmed but it hasn't been sewn, but it's lying naturally flat against the inside of the garment. So I could either sew it or else I could get a ribbon like this and then sew it, I would sew it with cotton down either side just like that and that gives it a really nice finish on the inside of the garment. But before I sew on the, the ribbon I will block the garment so that I know it's lying in exactly the right shape and I'll also steam press the ribbon in case it shrinks and then putting it over the top like that and it's going to look really beautiful. My day-to-day -day activities include taking care of my two smallest children, helping my husband run our landscaping business, and knitting. I try to squeeze in a little knitting each night as well as periods throughout the day when I find I have the time. Um, I'm also an avid tennis player. Knitosophy is a blend of knitting and philosophy. So while knitting is my outlet for creativity, I am a thinker and no matter how advanced I become in the art of knitting, um, I will always consider myself a student of the craft. I also enjoy uh, spinning and sewing and stitching by hand, but knitting dominates. I was initially drawn to knitting by the desire to make wool garments, specifically I was attracted to the look of the basic stitch patterns stockinette and garter. Um, they're both incredibly eye-pleasing, not to mention functional, and it seemed like such a marvelous skill to be able to knit something so intricate and beautiful. I remember when I first started knitting stockinette and saw the V's start to form and being amazed with myself. like wow, I'm making this. It had seemed like something that couldn't be done by hand. Um, moreover, wool was like a treasure to me, and to be able to make something with it felt very special. I was delighted to discover um, all the delicious decisions you get to make for each knitting project. Uh, what pattern do I want to knit? Do I want to work with wool, alpaca, cotton, etc. Or maybe a combination of fibers. Um, and what color? Or do I want a multicolor or speckled yarn? The knitting decisions
decision process is like walking into an ice cream shop and getting to make and then eat your very own ice cream recipe. It's a complex but fun process for me. I also greatly enjoy the act of knitting. Sometimes I slip into what I call the knitting zone, where knitting feels like meditation. Um, my hands are working, but my mind is still. Time becomes irrelevant. All problems are blotted out. And I become disconnected from everything but my knitting. Um, after making some progress on a project, I often emerge from this zone feeling at ease in life and simply fulfilled. It's a good feeling. <laughs> I'm now going to share with you some of my favorite projects that I've knit over the years, um, or at least those that are still in my possession. I'm going to start with a couple of brioche projects. Brioche is highly addictive once you get the hang of it. Um, this is the Pink Madness Scarf by Leslie Ann Robinson. And this is an excellent example uh, for demonstrating the reversibility of two color brioche. In this project, Leslie actually has you graft a wrong side with a right side so that you have both on the right side um, for the scarf. But I love this edging here and these tassels are so fun. I've received a ton of compliments on the scarf. And then next, I'd like to share with you the Rebel 2 shawl, which is also a pattern by Leslie Ann Robinson. The brioche lace on this project is breathtaking. And of course, I've got to show you the wrong side. The wrong side is my favorite side. Because I love that dark green. I'd now like to share with you my Matins dress. Now, I knit this some time ago. Uh, the designer is Alex Capshaw Taylor but I still wear it out on special occasions. You can see that the top transitions into three tiers of lace, and each section of lace is a different pattern. It's incredibly stunning and timeless. Um, I'm not sure whether I'll knit another dress, so it's very sentimental to me. Of course, I had to share with you a couple of my favorite sweaters. Um, both I've knit recently. The first I'm wearing now, it's called Sunset Highway, and it's by Caitlin Hunter of Boyland Knitworks. I love how the color work of the yoke coordinates beautifully with the color work at the elbows. A lot of my friends have knit this sweater and we're all obsessed with it. Um, it's a very popular design. It's very airy and light but it also is well suited for fall in the States, at least here in the South. Um, this is probably the 12th time I've worn this sweater this month alone. And I especially love um, all the speckled yarn that I chose for my sweater. It just makes it more funky and fun. Um, another sweater, which is also by Caitlin, is called Zweig. For this pattern, I, I just cannot get over how Caitlin has masterfully pulled all this together. The color work at the top with the little triangles, the color work at the bottom with the little bars, all with this big section of lace at the middle. Uh, it's got some kind of triangular shapes or maybe some diamonds in there. It's really amazing to me how she comes up with this stuff. Um, and I don't know if you can see the detail down there on the body but um, she's also incorporated some texture just to make it even more interesting uh, because none of Caitlin's designs are boring, <laughs> which is why I love her designs so much. But um, right now, I would say Zweig and Sunset Highway are my two favorite sweaters. Lastly, I'd like to share with you what is likely my magnum opus. Um, this is the Hearts Blanket. The designer is Bonnie Franz, and the pattern can be found in Noro Knitting Magazine. I forget which issue. Um, but <laughs> if you know me, then you know I'm a sucker for color. So this blanket is very me. <laughs> you can see it's intarsia, 
and the color of each square is a different color from the heart inside. It was a lot of fun. Um, and then I, I used mattress stitch to sew all the squares together in the end. That was a lot of work, <laughs> but very worth it. I keep this blanket out year round. And of course I gotta show you the back. The back gives you a little taste of my color work method, which is less than orthodox. <laughs> I don't do floats. I stuck with mostly blues and greens, but I also tried to incorporate a lot of warm colors in there to make it balanced. But I just, I love just looking at this blanket. Jamie for sharing with us your corner of the knitting world that was really lovely to see she's got such good fashion sense hasn't she yeah yeah, yeah. just very she certainly makes knitwear look very cool it does help that she's very gorgeous but um, if you look at her Ravelry page and her blog post you can see that Jamie is very passionate about knitting and very um, she really throws herself into learning new techniques and doing it her own way, which I really admire. She, um, she has a blog post on her technique for avoiding floats in yes. stranded knitting. Yeah, she I does. Think. Yeah. Yep. And um, I did also see on her blog she's got some really cute things for the kids. She does. She's got everything she knits, all, all of the garments that she's knitted, they just look so stylish and, and so well done. It's yep. really beautiful. Yep. Yeah. Were you saying she's a test knitter for Caitlin? Yes, I'm she talking. is. She is. She's um, very enamoured with uh, Caitlin's designs, yep. as you heard, which I totally understand because I think Caitlin Hunter is one of the most exciting designers that, that's come up. I think, I think she's great. We did an interview with her in episode 41. So if you haven't seen it and you want to learn more about Caitlin Hunter, go back and have a look at it. I think she's got great, great designs. And she's only got a few because she's only started, but she's really exciting to watch and, and see what comes. Yep. Yeah. So, um, and we've got a live event with Caitlin Hunter coming up in January. January with our patrons. So patrons, start thinking about all the questions and topics that you'd like to hear Jamie talk about. That's coming up in January. And while we're still talking about Caitlin Hunter, I am going to knit one of her designs. So I have just finished uh, this Fair Isle, complicated Fair Isle garment, and I'm about to start a, a garment from Marie Wallen's Shetland book. And the one that I chose, the one that I love the best, Marie has told me is one of the most difficult ones. So I figured that I need a palette cleanser in, in the meantime. And this is, I'm doing the Tecna. Here's a picture of the Tecna. And it's a one color stocking stitch with a bit of lace. So I think that's perfect as a palette cleanser. Mm -hmm. And Caitlin in the interview describes this garment as a elevated basic. And she's she brought it out in summer and it's clearly like a lightweight summer. Uh, top, but I'm going to hack the pattern a little bit and make it an elevated basic winter top. So, <laughs> are you trying to deny summer, uh, deny winter this year? No, but I, I want to wear it as soon as I'm going to finish it. And I, okay. and we live in Germany, that means that you've got winter for 10 months of the year. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bit rude, Dulls. <laughs> well, as Australians, yeah. it's not. Okay. Um, so I'm going to add long sleeves to it and I might just change a few little things maybe around the neck, whatever, but I will do my best to keep the integrity of uh, the original design. So I'm sure Kate, Caitlin won't mind me hacking it a little bit, but yeah. <laughs> I'll do my best to keep it beautiful like, like the original. And I'm swatching for that right now. 
And I noticed... Very good. Yes, I always swatch. Yeah. And I've noticed that in my swatching, my gauge... I'm probably going to end up using a tighter gauge than what's recommended, which is kind of funny because it seems to be my habit. It's a bit of a theme there, Dals. <laughs> there is a bit of a theme. Thank you to everyone who joined our Fruity Brioche Cal. It was yeah. really cool to see how many people jumped in there and had their first attempt at brioche. Yeah. I, I think even if you're not planning to use this technique a lot, just giving it a go will have improved your knitting skills. Absolutely. Every time you challenge yourself to learn different movements through learning new techniques, I think you're training your brain to understand knitting much better. And then when you come back to your normal knitting, I think you find that you're so much more relaxed, you're less fearful, and you find it all easier. What about you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still in the challenged phase, but I would certainly look forward to coming back to my normal knitting and finding it easier. Yeah. That sounds good. Yeah. Wait till you finish your whole project. When I you will finish, finish your my whole project. project, you'll be a whiz, you'll be a new man. A new man. Mm. Do you need a new man, Dals? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> Andrea and I are donating two books as prizes for this cal. Um, the first one is Nancy Marchant's latest book, and that's called Tuck Stitches. This book is partly a stitch ditch dictionary with over 90 stitch patterns, original stitch patterns, but also includes eight full patterns for scarves, um, cows, and I think there's even a blanket pattern in there. Tuck Stitches make really wonderful reversible fabric, so similar to brioche. The winner of this book is Ferran Moreno from Barcelona. Ferran knitted the River Rock scarf by Anka Mastia, and that pattern appeared in the Rib magazine recently. Uh, Ferran used the Brooklyn Tweed yarn Arbor, and it is a really stylish pattern, Andrea. Yes, it is a stylish pattern, but he's a stylish man. Right. <laughs> so well done, Ferran. That's great. And I think... Ferran, you're really going to love this book because I had a look at your project page and I can see that you're knitting a lot of scarves and cowls and blankets. In fact, Ferran is presently working on Stephen West's Brio Chevron. I Very think, good. I think that's how you say it. <laughs> but I think this is right down your alley. Um, it's a brilliant book and so I'm really excited that you've got it. So well done. It sounds like he'll get a lot of use out of that. Yeah, yeah. Good. The second book we're donating is Nancy Marchant's Knitting Fresh Brioche, which is the standard brioche classic that every brioche knitter should have in their library. And the winner of this book is Katie from Alaska, and her reverie name is Kate Moak. I think that's how you say it. So that is amazing. We've got a winner from Alaska and a winner from Barcelona. That's good geographical coverage. It's brilliant. So Katie entered three times with three different hat projects. The hat which came up as winning was the Flaming Hat by Elzbita Torenk, which is on the left, but she also knitted the gorgeous hat, which is Liguria by Catherine Schubert, which is the hat on the right. So well done to Ferran and Katie. That's brilliant. I hope you love your books. And so if you can personal message me on Ravelry with your postal uh, address details, I will send you out your Christmas presents. <laughs> no, your, your, your prizes, prizes. Yes. Yeah. We've now produced 43 episodes of the Fruity Knitting Podcast, which is amazing. Yeah. Um, I like to say that I'm the mascot, but Andrea does the real work that makes this show come out. Uh, she works at home and so often works into the evening and on weekends. I get to see the care and dedication and just plain hard work that goes into each episode that goes out. Um, to let Andrea continue this work, we need financial support. And so we are asking if you enjoy, have enjoyed the programs that we have produced and would like to see it continue, please become a patron of the Fruity Knitting Podcast. It's really easy to do. It's completely flexible. You can become a patron for a very small amount of money, but it does add up and make it possible for us to keep going. Yeah. So please check it out in the link below. We also want to announce that Blacker Yarns have offered an exclusive discount to the Fruity Knitting patrons. So it's 15% off, so 15% discount of all their yarns until New Year's Eve for our patrons. That's a really generous offer and I'm really excited that they offered that for, our, for yep. our patrons. That's really great. We have used some of their yarns so we can recommend it. Um, the, Your socks. My socks. The socks that Andrew's yeah. just finished knitting for me is the mohair blend, which I really love. That's great. It's so beautiful. I can, yeah, try that out for sure. And you're knitting with 
their birthday yarn, which is the brushwork. Brush yeah. Yep. And this is a really gorgeous yarn. This is a mixture of um, Scottish Beaumont with 10% of a very rare breed sheep called Castle Milk Morret. Yep. And Castle Milk Morret, because Morret means red, has got a dark sort of brown fleece. And just by putting the 10% in, it means that when you dye the yarn, it has a heathered effect or a tweedy effect. And it's very, very soft. And, and um, not Castle Milk, Scottish Beaumont is a really interesting sheep because it's a uh, cross between Merino and Shetland. Yeah. That's very luxurious. Yep. Looking at um, the Blackie Yarns website, I saw that they actually have quite a few free patterns that you can download. So for this yarn in particular, they've got a couple of beautiful jumpers and some scarves. And the designer is Sonia Bargilvoska. I mm -hmm. hope that's right, Sonia. <laughs> Sonia is the marketing director of um, the manager Yarns. Yeah, of Blacker Yarns. And you're actually going to see her in the intro to the interview, which is coming up. She'll be there waving. So you can put a face to a name and a designer. And, uh, yeah, so thank you very much, Blacker Yarns. And patrons, take use of that, that discount and try out some new breed-specific yarns if you haven't. But coming up now, we've got something so special for you. You might remember back in episode 32, we met Christy as our guest on Knitters of the World. Christy lives in one of the most remote places on earth. Exmouth is a little tropical holiday destination in Western Australia and is right next to the Ningaloo Reef, which is a world heritage area with brilliant diving, snorkeling, beaches and wildlife. Just to give you an idea of the weather there, summer often reaches 40 degrees Celsius or 110 degrees Fahrenheit, and winter averages around 25 degrees Celsius or 80 degrees Fahrenheit. That's so hot. <laughs> <laughs> Despite the heat, Christy knits throughout the year very dedicated, and she has organised a wonderful community project of making a yarn art reef from freeform knitting, crochet, weaving, tatting, needle lace and other crafts. It took 18 months with over 500 pieces being made by 70 volunteers. It's absolutely amazing, the result. It's an incredible project. It's beautifully done. They've researched it a lot. It's, it's wonderful. And we feel so honoured that Christy has allowed us to show you uh, this little film that she's made of this community project. So I think you're really going to enjoy it. She made the film and we have put some accompanying music together with it. And just so that you understand what you're listening to, it's a symphonic poem that's written for orchestra by the French Impressionist composer Claude Debussy. And it's called, because I called, don't speak French. It's called Prelude à l'après-midi d'un faune. Which, which means? Which means Prelude to the Afternoon of a Faun. Yes. <laughs> it's very a, sweet. It's a very mystical piece of music, actually, and every time that I listen to Debussy, I always think of water. It's very improvisational and free form, which I think goes perfectly as an accompaniment to this extraordinary free form crafting that you're about to it's see. An artistic piece. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's stunning. So well done, Christy, for doing this community project, and I hope you all really enjoy it.
Donna Dombey or Knit and Nag, and this is my new design, Daffodini. Daffodini is a completely reversible lace shawl that's knit using two contrasting colors of fingering weight yarn. It's designed using a combination of seed stitch and a Shetland lace pattern. Seed stitch is a really great stitch to use when you're trying to change colors and still create a reversible fabric. Because unlike garter stitch, which creates a whole row of pearl bumps on one side of the fabric um, where you really see that the color is changing, um, seed stitch tends to blend that so it looks the same on both sides. So you see how the stripes transition here and on the other side it looks exactly the same. Daffodini is a triangular shawl and it's knit on a bias. You cast on in this upper corner and you work your way across like that. And then you're going to be binding off along this outside edge here, this yellow part. It also has a pico edging along the outer edge for some extra visual interest. Daffodini is a part of a collection that's called Reversible Lace that contains a number of lace shawls that are all designed to be very wearable because when you wear your lace shawls, you're going to be moving around in your usual day-to-day -day activities and it might slide around and you don't want to have to worry about having the right side, the wrong side showing of the shawl, but just throw it on and it looks good no matter which side of the fabric that's showing. You can wear it in a number of different ways. I mean, this tends to be the classic shawl way. Uh, you could put it over a little black dress for a bit of a party outfit, or you can bunch it up a bit more around your neck and wear it with jeans and t-shirt, or as a scarf under a jacket now that it's getting cold here in the winter. I hope you'll enjoy knitting this shawl as much as I did, and uh, thank you for watching. Thank you, Anna, for showing us your lovely reversible lace design. Dulls, I did think the Shetland lace part of that design looks very similar to the bird's eye lace yeah. pattern that uh, Elizabeth Johnson was showing us in episode 40. Yes, definitely. Yeah, it's true. But I liked it. Yeah. I like the combination of the uh, the lace and the seed stitch. Yes. Yeah. A bird theme. <laughs> bird seed, you think? Bird seed, yeah. Right. Coming up now is the interview with Sue Blacker of Blacker Yarns and this is a really informative interview and also fun. I think you're going to enjoy it a lot. You'll also get to see Sue's own flock of Gotland sheep, which are very handsome looking sheep, yeah. I have to say. Yeah. yeah. So we are actually going to take a little break. We, I have not had a holiday since Christmas last year and we're going to go to Snowdonia, Wales again to have a holiday. I have been working very hard. It's been a great yes. year, but a lot of work, and I do need to stay fresh. So we will be having a, a break over that time. Not a proper break, because actually <laughs> we are going to be do some, doing some interviews, yep. because we're in the proximity of some fantastic people that we really want to be able to share with you. So it won't be a full break, but it will mean that our schedule won't be the same just over the Christmas, New Year's, period so you have to bear with us but it's important that I stay fresh so that next year we've got another fantastic year of of programming more inspiration yeah coming yep. for you yep. but I, I want to thank you so much for being with us through the last 18 months we've been doing it now for 18 months and also for the generosity of our patrons without you there's no way that we could do this show absolutely no way there's just too much work involved and so thank you so much for your belief in us and your support we absolutely appreciate it and thank you to everybody have a wonderful festive holiday month with family and friends yep and did you mention that we are going to bring out a, a, a yes, special yes we've got another lovely interview that we're going to bring out over christmas um, that we did from in shetland so we've got another interview from the shetland period and you're going to enjoy it it's got a lovely family theme to it yep yeah that's great. Yep. So, see you soon. Have a lovely time. Enjoy this interview. It's a great interview. I had fun doing it. Yep. Thanks for being with us today and all the other episodes. We really enjoy it. Thanks for your feedback and everything. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.
Welcome to the Fruity Knitting Podcast. My guest today is a very interesting and talented woman. Sue Blacker was once a stockbroker working in the heart of the financial district in London. This is not the obvious background for a passionately pro-organic and environmentally active sheep farmer. But Sue strongly believes in buying and making locally and creating things to last. She's the owner of the Natural Fibre Company, which is a specialist woolen mill in Cornwall, where farmers can send small quantities of fleece to be spun into yarn. Sue has gained a wealth of information and experience through working very closely with sheep farmers all over the UK and through developing yarns for her own brand, Blacker Yarns. I'm very excited that Sue has agreed to come on the podcast and share her knowledge with us. So thank you, Sue, for your time and welcome. Thank you, Andrea. It's nice to talk. So, Sue, when I was reading up on you for this interview, I was deeply impressed at your wealth of knowledge. You've got a wealth of knowledge in many different areas, from sheep breeds to the uh, technical production of yarn, um, sustainable and organic sheep farming, and the yarn industry in general. So, can you just start by telling us a little bit of background on yourself and how you acquired this knowledge? That's quite easy. I started, uh, I was born and brought up in Cornwall. And like most young people then, I went away to university and from there I went into the city and did finance. I studied history at university and I think that gives you a bit of a long view sometimes, which is quite helpful. Um, But also you you have to learn stuff and I just love learning, so I've always wanted to learn. After a while, the city became a bit dull and boring, to be honest. Uh, Most people wouldn't think that, but... uh, when you've done it for a few years, uh, I think you, well, I grew out of it. And then moved back to Cornwall, where I ran an environmental charity and then a woodland charity. And during that time, we got some sheep to keep the grass down. And from that, I started with getting their wool processed by the Natural Fibre Company when it was in Wales. And then when Myra and Philip wished to retire, it looked like the timing was right for my life and theirs and I was able to buy the company, relocate it to Cornwall and start in 2005. So we've just had our 12th birthday. I have to confess your bit about the knowledge. We may be able to spin yarns, but I'm not a very good hand spinner at all. <laughs> and what about, can you just explain briefly the relationship between the Natural Fibre Company and Blacker Yarns? Yes, it's very straightforward. The Natural Fibre Company is a commission spinning company. It spins for all sorts of customers from quite large ones uh, all across Europe down to very small, small holdings with only a few sheep or goats or alpacas. And amongst its customers is Blacker Yarns. So in that sense, we simply have an in-house customer. We found that there was a lot of lovely fleece around that people weren't necessarily wishing to process themselves and it was too good an opportunity to miss and so the main difference is that we make either in blacker yarns we might make either blends of breeds or individual limited edition breeds but they're from a whole breed from the UK whereas all of our local natural fiber company people they have the direct provenance of my sheep my fields my yarn right right there 
And you did a survey, which I thought was very interesting. Right when you bought the natural fibre um, company, you did a survey amongst sheep farmers who were wanting to turn their, their fleece into yarn. So talk a little bit about that, because that, that's a very clever thing to do, to get this research and information. It seemed like the right thing to do, really, to market research. I was, I was going to be having to write a business plan, having to get money from the bank, having to apply for grants. And for that, they want to know that you actually understand your market. So very helpfully, Myra was willing to let me send out an email questionnaire to all her database and we later on updated it a few years later, and we now do a small survey almost every year. And so we were asking people things like how many sheep or goats or alpacas they had, whereabouts in the country they were, whether they were planning to grow, uh, stay the same, maybe retire, so that we had an idea of their, their future plans, and then also a, a good idea of the types of fibre all of these, of course, were already either customers or contacts of the natural fibre company. So in that sense, it was a limited uh, cross-section. But we were obviously pretty lucky because we had a 15% return, which is pretty high. Most, most male questionnaires get 2%. Uh, and trudging through 400 or so replies took, took me a while. Uh, but from that, we, we developed our business plan. So, Sue, a lot of knowledge goes into the process of designing a new yarn. So can you explain to us some of the decisions that you have to make during this process? For example, when farmers send you their fleece and you have to know what kinds of characteristics the fleece has, so what possibilities it can be made into, what, um, whether it can be woolen or worsted spun or whether it's suitable for dyeing or would you make it into a heathered yarn, all of that kind of thing. Maybe you could just tell us some of these decisions and how you come about them. Okay. The first fundamental decision is what type of fibre is it? And Perhaps it's worth knowing that uh, why a yarn happens. You have hairs, as on our heads, and it's actually chemically the same. But the differences between those different hairs in different breeds and between, say, sheep and goats and goats and alpacas is the surface of those fibres. So if you look at something like our hair or alpaca or mohair, the surface of the hair has got very smooth scales on it, but it is scales. If So you, you think uh, snake skin. If, on the other hand, you look at a, a sheep's wool, the scales are very much more pronounced, and so you'd think maybe crocodile skin. So when you twist the fibres together, the more pronounced the scales are, the easier it is to make a yarn, and that's what holds the yarn together. So it's actually harder to spin smooth fibres than it is to spin the, the fibres with, with more pronounced scales. Then you have the situation that you can blend them together so that you can add some more wool to a very smooth fibre to enable it to spin better, because the other bit of it is you can obviously have loads of it, you can spin it, and it will hold together. But if you want to make very fine yarns, you need to blend some wool into quite a lot of, for example, a lace weight alpaca could do with 10-15% wool to hold it together. So the fibre is crucial. And then, of course, we have this, in, in the UK, we are very lucky. We have over 60 different breeds of sheep, and they're all incredibly various and different. So therefore, we get different types of fibre. This one here is Borore. Borore is one of the rarest British breeds, and because of the promotion that we've been able to do with it, there are four times as many sheep as there were five or six years ago, which is great news. But it is quite a coarse fibre, and it's got sticking out long, coarse hairs in it. This sort of fibre will really only wool and spin. We cannot worsted spin borore, although we do in our St Kilda yarn add a small proportion of borore because of the origins of the borore sheep from St Kilda. So a woolen spun yarn is when we have cleaned the fibre, spread it all out on the carding machine, having um, teased it all apart after cleaning it. We then card it 
and it's only carded. Carding means that it's spread out in both directions very smoothly and then we slice it up and each individual slice is spun into a yarn, a single yarn, which can then be plied to make this one, which is an Aran yarn. If you, on the other hand, have a yarn, a fibre which you can worsted spin, and for example, this is our Black of Swan Merino yarn, this one, after partly carding it, is also combed. So the main difference is you have a carded yarn and a combed yarn. When you comb, you take out the finer bit, sorry, the coarse <laughs> the coarser bits and the short bits, so you end up with a much more refined product. The result of it, and you can probably see quite clearly, and we'll, we've got some inset photos to show you as well, is that you get a much smoother result. So a worsted spun yarn is smoother, much smoother than a woolen yarn, which is quite fluffy. The woolen spun yarn will carry air, so it could be lighter, it's much more elastic, tends to go further when you're knitting. So you get about four more rows for your 10 centimetres in a woolen spun than you would in a worsted spun yarn. The worsted spun, on the other hand, is smooth and drapey. So if you have any coarse fibres, because you've aligned them all, it will actually feel quite a lot softer. So when we've got these, and th these are absolute extremes. This is sub 20 micron merino from the Falkland Islands. And this is probably in the region of 40 microns, although it's got some very fine fibres in it because the nature of Borrowe sheep is they have a double coat. So you're looking at the sublime and the ridiculous, if you like, but the very different possibilities of what you can then make. So the first thing you look at is what will the fibre do? Then you say, well, OK, what's the most suitable yarn for it? And with the yarn and the fibre, you then end up with a purpose. So a woolen spun yarn, because it's fluffy, ideal for eventually weaving into, say, blankets and scarves, things that you want fluffy, air, insulation, warmth with. And also the same for if you do your knitting or crochet, it's going to give you bulk and softness and lightness. Whereas with a worsted spun yarn, you get much smoother, therefore softer feeling, more suitable for babies, stronger yarn, more suitable for fine weaving, like suiting. And that's basically how you, you sort of have from one end to the other of the spectrum, really. We also, of course, have natural colour. So the, this is natural colour of the Borore, this is the natural colour of the Merino. And people have spent an awful lot of years, thousands of years, breeding sheep to be white, so that we can add colour. So dyeing is the next thing that you can do to add interest to either a woolen or a worsted spun yarn. So that's really interesting and very detailed, but you've got quite a range of um, yarns. So what else can you show us that shows uh, the possibilities of, of blending and, and using different fibres? I'm going to use blacker yarns as samples for these because they are, you know, I've got loads of examples. Um, with the merino yarn, the white that we originally started with, one of the key things about this very white yarn is that when you dye it, it takes colour so well and so brightly that it does tend to look a little acrylic and artificial. So what we actually do is we make a, what well, our first blend is Pale Maiden. Now this has got a small proportion of Shetland wool in it, which tends changes the colour. And with the result of this, we end up with a base over which we can dye more attractively than just over the white. So Black as Swan is a, a basic pure merino. It runs from one farm only, and it's worsted spun because merino otherwise, if you woolen spin merino, it's ever so bulky and it, it really doesn't behave well. It's, um, it's got a lot of memory in it, has merino. It's very fine. It's got it's a very fine crimp. So one of the things about making it worsted is that we're trying to forget some of that memory so that we can control it to make something more usable. But you do find still that merino yarns are quite difficult to block. On the other hand, we have our um, classic, 
Now, the classic was something that we introduced as a, a basic yarn to complement all the rare breeds, the individual rare breed yarns that we started with. And classic has got about a third blue face Leicester for softness. It's a woolen spun yarn. The remainder of the yarn is a mixture of white wool, but also in this particular case, Manx Lochten brown wool, which again gives us a sandy coloured base over which we can dye. This one dyes beautifully turquoise olive, for example, really nice. So this is very much a woolen spun yarn. It won't feel as soft. And I think this is one of the things that when one's trying to explain to a knitter, she's pretty much always going to say, oh, I love the merino. The merino is great. That's just what I want. But the merino will not be good for socks. You'll wear it out. It's too fine. It's too soft. It wears out. It will also, because it's fine, it will pill. This, on the other hand, much better for socks, will not pill. It will be not as soft to touch. However, the other attribute, which is one of the things I absolutely love about woolen spun yarns, is that over time they soften and mature much more than the highly refined and trained worsted yarn. So this will gradually, with use, it will gradually felt a little bit together, soften, and it will become like your most favourite thing. With the worsted spun, yeah, you'll have some style, it'll be fantastic, it's for the right occasions, uh, and over time it will wear, and it will actually get thinner rather than softer and thicker. So that, again, is a, dis a, a difference. Then we start having fun. So, for example... I've got a little range of all sorts of things here. These are typical other things that we can do. So if you don't think that wool on its own is interesting enough, then you can add a little bit of silk. And we have our Samite blend, which uses high welfare silk. Now this we deliberately made as a woolen spun yarn. It's one of the finest yarns that our machinery will make. And it's a three ply weight. We're, I've always loved three ply weight because it's just a lovely, um, lovely stitch definition, lovely drape to it, lovely fine stuff. So that's got a little bit of uh, silk in it. Now the silk, although it is a protein, takes the dye differently from the wool. So we end up with a much more variegated surface because the silk has tiny little slubs in it and a variegated appearance to the yarn itself when it's dyed. That can be further exaggerated if you go into a tweeded yarn, which is our West Country tweed and also this year's birthday yarn was a tweeded yarn, when, when we go into colours we actually have to dye the wool before we can spin it so that we can blend the colours together and in this case we've added little tiny knots of colour called neps which uh, make the, the, the contrast and brightness of, of the yarn. You then get something else entirely, which is taking the luster. Now, luster yarns are made from Wensleydale, uh, Teeswater, Border Leicester, Leicester Long Wool. Blue Face Leicester isn't quite really a luster yarn. It's what's called semi-luster. So it's got a little bit of a shine. When you make it on its own, it takes colour very, very brightly. When you blend together the luster and you also make it as a worsted or a semi-worsted yarn in this case, then you get much brighter colour showing. Because again, what, what we've done all the time, when you create a worsted spun yarn and you use a shiny fibre, you're making the surface reflect the light much more. So the colours will always look brighter. And then we have the, the one that, that is really quite popular at the moment. This is a mohair blend. So we've actually taken really dark, almost black Hebridean wool in this particular case, 50-50 with mohair. We also do one with Manx Lochten and mohair, which is a softer sort of silvery, it's difficult to explain, it's a silvery beige, uh, whereas the Hebridean mohair is sort of like shiny anthracite. But because of the amount, the 50% of mohair in it, it takes colour, all the mohair, grabs the colour and makes something which you think you'd dye that was black, almost. You'd think if you dyed it, it would not show any colour. And of course, it comes up 
really bright. So these are where we end up with loads of fun and, and variety. Yes, I know the um, mohair blend. Actually, Andrew's making a pair of socks for me at the moment, and my daughter has made a pair for her grandma for Christmas out of the uh, the Hebridean, the Hebridean and mohair. And I, I love it. I love the way it feels. I love the Christmas to it. It's also very um, warm, and I love that you don't have any bit of plastic in it because of the mohair and the strength from the mohair. Oh, good. I'm glad you like it. I've got a couple of samples here which I thought might be interesting. I don't know how well the camera will show these, but we've got one on my left hand which is made with black as swan and one on my right hand made with tweed. And they are both the same pattern, which is our Holt mittens. This is worsted spun, this is woolen spun. With the worsted spun you do get more stitch definition. But with the woolen spun, you get more bulk and you can probably see the contrast clearly. So if I want warm mittens, I wear these. If I want elegant mittens, I wear these. It really helps you once you know about yarn, doesn't it? <laughs> to make really great projects. Yeah. I mean, I can show you on slightly larger things as well. This is one of our, this is Blue Face Lester, uh, dyed. So it's quite bright and it's a really, you can see how it really drapes. It's a worsted spun, quite fine lace weight yarn. On the other hand, this is the Samite, as I showed you earlier. It doesn't drape as much. It doesn't sort of flow in the same way, but it's got more bulk and this one has got the silk in it. And then we go to something like our big old breed, the, the, um, the really solid yarns. And this, of course, is crochet as well, which is much more sculptural and this is using the um your favorite yarn the mohair yeah. yarns and you can see that that's much more bulky and it doesn't flow or drape in the same way so it, it's fitting the fiber to the yarn and then the yarn to the purpose but also if you go the other way you say okay i want to make a yarn that will do this so with the sock yarn for example you have a plan and you say, I will put together the things which will enable me to make this and to dye it in these colours, etc. So I can imagine that a lot of your accumulated yarn production knowledge has possibly come from trial and error. So now with your experience and you look back, are there any yarns that you made in the past that you would now see as mistakes or that you would do very differently? And if that's the case, can you just explain a little bit of what you've learnt from that process? When you do dyeing, if you make a mistake, you can over dye. And so eventually, I don't, I don't know whether it's uh, dyers who persuaded all the world that black is the most fashionable colour, but eventually, when you cover all your mistakes, you can dye something black. <laughs> that's one option um, in yarns however I think probably our biggest mistake which is a real shame was to try to make a worsted spun Gotland yarn Gotland as a an unusual minority breed in this country is generally bred coarse because it's used for sheep skins rather than for spinning and so in the UK breeders have selected to get much much finer yarn and we now can make lovely fine yarns nevertheless it does feel a little bit hard so we thought great we'll make it a worsted spun yarn it'll be wonderful but it sheds when going back to the business of the smoothness of the fibers the smoother the fibers are and this is a particular issue with some alpaca yarns in particular if you make a worsted spun alpaca yarn it will shed and I have a, um, a machine knitted Gotland jacket, which I love very much. But before I wear it and after I wear it each time, I have to brush it off because otherwise I go around in a cloud of fluff. So we now make our, our Gotland yarn as a woolen spun yarn and we encourage people to knit it and wash it. And it does soften tremendously as, as it um, ages. And so that, that was one. Another one, I suppose, was we, we made blends of alpaca and wool. And that, I guess, was something of a marketing mistake. We sold it as a blend. 
and it seemed that people who like wool didn't like it and people who like alpaca didn't like it. So it sort of never really sold terribly well, even though it was a lovely yarn. So you, you get all sorts of mistakes that you learn from and you look at how you can market better, how you can describe better. We spend a lot of time photographing as accurately as possible and describing as accurately. We have little icons of numbers of sheep and size of fiber for each of our yarns on the website for blacker yarns so that it shows that some coarse fiber might make a fine a soft yarn and some fine fiber may, might make a, a harsher yarn. Um, we call them strong not harsh. That sounds very interesting. It's it, you're it's exciting, but you're also vulnerable, aren't you? As you said, you might come up with a great yarn, but f for some reason it's not uh, fashionable or the marketing didn't quite work. And, and so, yeah, you've lost out on that yarn. But, that's, but thank you for um, yeah, sharing that experience with us. It's very interesting. And I've just got one last question for you because on your website under values, you've written, we believe it is wrong to use oil-based or high energy input fibers when wool and other natural fibers are sustainable, high performance raw materials providing warmth, insulation and comfort. And for the sake of people living on the planet in the future, we believe in doing as little damage as possible. So I'd like you to say something quickly about this because vegans do have a problem using, or many vegans have a problem using wool. So can you briefly talk about the pros and cons of producing animal fibres and plant fibres and perhaps even mention the campaign for wool? It is a difficult issue. Some people have very strong views, which I respect. Um, there are plenty of vegetarians who will wear wool and there are some flocks of sheep which are no-kill flocks, so they just let the sheep live out their natural lives. Others, of course, produce meat, which the vast majority of the world are, is carnivorous. Uh, so there's a huge range of options. I think the thing that one needs to feel happy about is one's own conscience. And, and um, when I took on my bigger flock, when I moved from having just a few pet lambs, I had to make a decision about killing them because they breed, they want to breed, Naturally, that's what animals, including ourselves, of course, what we do. And so, so you end up with either having to eat them or sell them to someone else. But eventually, we'd be, you know, there'd be too many animals in the world. <laughs> there may be too many people in the world as well. That's, of course, an issue. So growing fibres instead, so you've got cotton, flax, things like that, is an option. The trouble is that you have to process all of them. You have to kill the bugs to make the silk, except with a hemza. You have to treat the fibre like nettles and hemp and cotton, either with acid, which is the quick way to do it, or with water, which is the slow way to do it. And if you make something like bamboo and other viscose fibres, you have to use quite a lot of acid and temperature to process them into a usable fibre. So in terms of the number of things that you do to get from the sheep to the garment, there's actually it's quite a lot of processes in our mill, but relatively few in terms of total impact on the environment, I feel. Therefore, I think wool's great. The other thing about wool is it's been grown and designed by sheep to do what we want it to do, which is keep you warm, keep you dry, not catch fire, wick away your sweat, and wool does all of that without having to be a high-performance microfiber. It does it naturally. And those are the sort of things which the campaign for wool, which has been promoting wool specifically for a number of years now, is also trying to encourage people to understand. The only real downside of wool is it lasts a long time, so you can make a sweater. I mean, the sweater I'm wearing, it actually took me 10 years to knit this because I was rather busy doing other things. But I've had it for three or four years now and it looks and feels new and it will go on for another 20 years without wearing out. Yeah, it, it's, it definitely does hang around a long time, but it is biodegradable and that's brilliant. 
Eventually it does biodegrade, yes. And if you've not put loads of chemicals into it in the first place, um, the main thing by the time you get to put it on a landfill site is it will contain some detergent. And again, you need to look at which detergents you use in order to both maintain the, the quality of the fibre and also what happens to it when it's disposed of eventually. You can also recycle wool. You can chop up wool into smaller bits, tiny bits. You can recycle a whole garment by tearing it to bits, shredding it, and blend that shredded wool with new wool and make it work another life. That's very interesting. And so it's been really informative to talk to you. And I'm really grateful that you've chosen to spend some time um, giving us your knowledge so that we can learn from it as well. So thank you very much for spending time on the podcast. And I, so we should say goodbye to the audience now. <laughs> Bye. You. I've enjoyed it. Bye -bye. Thank you.